presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to Eddie in Boca Raton. Hey, Eddie, what's going on? Hey, Tom, how are you, man? I'm doing great, man. Yourself? Good, good. It is a treasure to have TFNN every hour during the trading day to be there to help you, to guide you, and even to give you some peace of mind or like that somebody else is there with you while you're, while you're trading this crazy market, either well, up or down. Well, listen, we appreciate you growling and with us out here because we wouldn't be out here, folks, if we didn't have all you guys, gals, tigers and tigresses as clients. And, you know, the market teaches you every single day, man. Now, Tom O'Brien. Welcome, folks. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom O'Brien. This will be my last day with you all. We are out Monday. The market is closed. And uh, Tom will be back Tuesday for some of that great Tom O'Brien show goodness. Uh, the market is exhausted. We are down a little bit. Uh, the, the buying is kind of done for right now, at least today. Uh, GDX is up. The gold contract um, is actually moving down a little bit right now. Um, so we'll see how that pans out at the end of the day. Gold is in this just strange kind of position right now where, um, you know, a lot of things might suggest on the, uh, the superficial that it should be going up, but uh, we're getting just kind of a mixed signal from it. So, again, I always defer to Tom. He's got the gold report. It is a uh, phenomenal uh, publication. Would really uh, recommend checking it out. Uh, NVIDIA is still up at 430 uh, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand. We'll get into that at some point in the show um, regarding some of the smaller guys. And I really want to focus a little bit on AMD as well and how I think that, you know, while AMD might be getting battered right now um, relative to NVIDIA, uh, I, I think it's still a positive choice on the long term. I want to take a look at Microsoft. That's down today, um, but it's been doing pretty well on the long term. And, uh, you know, this is really done uh, by its... Uh, Implementation, I suppose, of AI, obviously it acquired ChatGPT or at least invested a large sum into ChatGPT to kind of add it into its Bing search. Um, but one of the big things that Microsoft does, you know, they have Microsoft Azure, which is its cloud computing system. Uh, this is a pretty, I have a little bit of experience using Azure and I've studied like how to use it a little bit and what you can spin off, the different kind of like networking options you have, um, you know, data storage and everything. And I have a close acquaintance of mine uh, who works uh, basically on Azure, right? He works for another company doing uh, security, uh, but he does Azure implementation. And what's going, these guys get paid an immense amount of money. Like they, get, they get compensated very well uh, for the skills that they have, right? One of the biggest, uh, you know, victims that, of AI will be like knowledge-based workers, okay? And so... You know, of course, he doesn't just work on Azure, but it's a major part of his job in securely implementing it. Um, but the way that it's going now is there are more and more AI options for Azure to the point, you know, that it'll be someone who doesn't really have any experience with Azure security um, is going to be able to implement uh, secure Azure environments because the AI is just getting so good at it. According to this article here, the company could pick up 10 billion more in annual artificial intelligence revenue from developers using its Azure Cloud or OpenAI models. Uh, JP Morgan analysts raised their price target on Microsoft stock Wednesday. Uh, of course, that rose quite a bit to 348, trading off that just a little bit at 343. Uh, Microsoft is a major beneficiary of the rise of ChatGPT in tangential products on top of its hefty investment in OpenAI, which will pay off. Uh, the company provides the underlying computing power. Microsoft also has exclusive licenses on OpenAI's models, including the ChatGPT4 large language model that can spit out natural sounding words in response to humans' text input. We all know this. And of course, you know, the, the name of the game with this, and, and before ChatGPT had been acquired, or at least, you know, a large portion of it had been uh, basically taken over by Microsoft via their investment, um, what it was being used for was just very standard searches, right? And what it will soon really take over is you're just not going to have the need to 
have all these micro specializations, right? Like all these new tools that come out, um, and, I, and you know, I want to focus a bit on the cloud with that. Um, you're, you're, it's not going to be as much of an investment on the individual, and I mean, you know, time uh, to learn how these tools work because AI will really control a lot of it, right? There'll still be security around uh, the servers that control AI, and you'll have to have the knowledge of how that works. Um, but very soon, you know, it just, in, in a way, it kind of just um, lowers the barriers to entry, I would suppose, um, a lot of this AI does. In the past four quarters, Microsoft has generated almost $208 billion in total revenue. Um, and he went deeper onto it because it's really good, uh, excuse me, because it is really a very good platform, we have lots of different ways uh, that 10 billion of ARR is going to show up first. Following the event, JP Morgan analysts lifted their price target from 350, uh, excuse me, to 2350. So, you know, we were right around there and had to sell off. But th essentially, these companies have so much cash flow and they just have enough to uh, basically invest in any kind of program uh, that they're just going to absolutely dominate uh, the AI market. And uh, from that, we'll dominate cloud and kind of expand. And we see that a little bit with Amazon as well. We can pull that up. You know, they just recently acquired, they're, they're expanding in interesting ways into different kind of sectors in general, right? You know, they're doing um, pharmaceuticals for a while. And then, you know, today we're down a little bit. Again, this is kind of just an exhaustion in the market, but they purchased, uh, let's pull it up here for you. The Roomba, the Roomba Maker iRobot. Let's see if I can pull it up. And this was up today significantly, up 20% almost. That got the UK approval. Uh, you, you know, basically those are antitrust regulators and they have to uh, observe and see if there's any kind of, you know, monopolization occurring. Uh, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK said it decided not to escalate its initial investigation because it concluded that the deal would not result in substantial lessening of competition. And that's really how Amazon's doing it, right? When you, when you buy into these different um, sectors, essentially, or, uh, you know, different kind of supply chains, it's a little bit hard to get hit by these kind of antitrust laws. Consumer groups have voiced concerns, however, that Amazon's purchase of uh, iRobot, which makes room, of course, would widen the e-commerce giant's dominance in the smart home market. The acquisition is still facing review in the U.S. by the Federal Trade Commission amid worries about Amazon's growing market power. It's also under scrutiny by the European Union's executive arm, uh, which opened a review of the deal this month. It said iRobot has a modest UK market position, uh, already faces several significant rivals, and Amazon would have little incentive to give its products special treatment over rivals in its online store. But just being able to have these, you know, what may essentially become like Amazon generics, right, um, is a positive uh, for the company as a whole. And so that obviously enjoyed a really positive increase um, as well. Take a look at Meta. Meta's up a little bit today, been up and down, uh, trying to figure out, that's, a, I think, at least a positive look for the company is everything's being sold off pretty substantially. Um, and that, uh, of course, we're still down a little bit, but nowhere near that downdraft we saw on the open um, in a lot of other companies. Folks, stay tuned. We will be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. 
Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Welcome back, folks. Take a little bit of a look at Tesla. Give me the bigger picture on this one. Obviously had an extraordinary run up uh, since, <laughs> I mean, let's see. I mean, this is really quite impressive, right? Uh, the other day I was saying that one of the biggest, uh, you know, attractors to Tesla, you know, is not really like the car production, um, but it's going to be that, uh, that they're mapping all these routes in order to achieve um, self-driving, essentially, right? And then just the self-driving itself is so positive. And so Elon today uh, was actually speaking in France, and he says that the Tesla's market cap is directly tied to whether it solves autonomous driving. Now, he's looking at it as well. You know, he, you can tell he wants to get into, uh, you know, automated shipping uh, with the, with the um, cargo trucks that he developed. But also, you think about it as well, this is a major data opportunity for them. And if there's anything in the future uh, where they really have a, you know, market dominance regarding, uh, you know, autonomous driving, and there's some kind of antitrust thing that occurs, uh, they will be able to at least sell their data to other companies uh, who are going to be entering the market in that competition. So he was speaking in Paris, uh, the younger Arnault, who he was speaking with, um, Antoine Arnault, uh, ribbed Musk about Tesla's 827 billion market cap, noting it dwarfed the storied luxury conglomerate's valuation, of course. Uh, the Tesla CEO responded that valuations are a strange thing. Um, he goes also suggested that Tesla's market cap was tied again to whether or not the company could excuse me, perfect autonomous driving technology. The potential for autonomy is that the value of autonomy is so high that even if you have a discount, a percentage profitability of autonomy happening, that is extremely valuable. valuable. He also reiterated the idea of Tesla owners turning their vehicles into a fleet of self driving robo-taxis, an idea that he once said would be implemented by 2020. Of course, we are off of that. But if you think about it, it goes beyond just, you know, the, the cars driving themselves and people, I don't know, making robo-taxis so they can get some money from it. But it's just this idea that we now have something that's relatively intelligent that can move around um, our infrastructure and, um, you know, perform tasks. So, that capability, while it's positive, could get, in my opinion, hit by some kind of antitrust situation. Um, but the data for it is so positive. Moving on and some kind of uh, sticking with the tech, at least, I was speaking again how important it is, um, you know, that our country and companies 
understand cybersecurity, invest more into it. And we read yesterday that companies are actually de-investing from it currently. And I said, this is not a positive thing and uh, it, it will be a mistake. This is from today, uh, from the AP, and it turned out that a Russian ra uh, excuse me, ransomware gang uh, breached the energy department and other federal energies, uh, excuse me, other federal agencies. Uh, the Department of Energy and several other federal agencies were compromised in a Russian cyber extortion gang's global hack of a file transfer program popular with corporations and governments. Uh, but the impact was not expected to be great, they said. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the takeaway from it that they're, they're giving is that it was relatively superficial um, and they, you know, compared it to the SolarWinds hacking campaign, which was, you know, very advanced um, and maintained persistence for quite a while. But the point is, is not that it didn't have an extreme impact or anything like that, but it's the fact that, again, it just occurs. And this, these are government agencies. This happens to um, city agencies. Uh, you know, out in Texas, this happens a lot. It happened in San Francisco, uh, where there were ransomware gangs essentially targeting the infrastructure. And, you know, in, in some ways, it really is a cat and mouse game, right? It, hardening can only go so far. Um, but it is important to keep in mind that this is, is an arms race, right? So while there's going to be losses a lot uh, of the times, there will be just as many uh, wins if investment continues. If the Department of Energy is getting hacked, um, it's certain that a lot of large companies will be um, targeted by this kind of stuff as well. And this was from the Klopp gang, basically. Uh, based on discussions we've had with industry partners, these intrusions are not being leveraged to gain broader access, to gain persistence into targeted systems, or to steal specific high-value information. In some, as we understand it, the attack is largely an opportunistic one. But this is how uh, cyber gangs operate, right? You kind of poke your target and get some information. It's called the reconnaissance phase. And uh, you, you see what works, what doesn't, and how they respond. And so th these... They're brazen. And now, of course, there's evidence as well that this isn't, or excuse me, there's no evidence that they're connected to any kind of state actor um, from Russia. Um, but that can be sometimes uh, have its own bit of issues, right, where they are just fully focused on, uh, on getting money. And this, this really takes a lot uh, from companies. And it'll be, uh, continue to be an issue. And seeing that de-investment um, from cybersecurity solutions is uh, not a positive one and it really should not be in the back of anyone's mind. And I'm not saying this stuff to scare anyone or be, you know, you know, like the whole system is going to collapse. It's, it's not the case. But um, there needs to be at least some kind of public education regarding it. And there's not. And kind of on that point, and I'm going to take a, you know, a turn here for a second. And uh, I, I was watching some kind of YouTube short of a guy using something called a PV hook or a can't hook. And it's used basically just to give the operator leverage and um, basically move logs, right? And someone was bringing up something about it being a fulcrum, and I didn't think it was. So I, I went down this long rabbit hole of just kind of general, like, mechanics, right? Um, and I started thinking about, you know, when I was young and before the Internet, you know, we had, like, seesaws and all these kind of, you know, really simple mechanical machines. And in a way, that was a method that uh, the society we were in was teaching us how things worked, right? You know, nowadays, we've focused, we, we've basically adapted into the digital, right? But UI, user interface has gotten so good that nobody really, on average, has a great understanding of how programs work or how computers work. And uh, we don't have that opportunity that generations in the past did of, of learning how, you know, basic technology operates. You know, I think young people understand how algorithms work and how to beat them and so on. Um, but understanding, you know, what a file directory is and how that works or understanding how to keep yourself and your machine safe um, is just not there. And so it's resulting in kind of a more like ignorant population. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just there's not any real learning there, you know, where in the past you could see it in front of you. There's no way to really simplify a, a seesaw. It, it, it works how it works. Um, but with user interface, you can kind of simplify the experience for the users and it just kind of becomes, uh, you know, a second thought essentially, right? So, I don't know, I was thinking about that last night, maybe, you know, of course it's a rambling, but just some food for thought uh, regarding that. We'll go into this a little more, um, this headline a little more when we get back from the break, um, but this is, 
one of the Fed officials kind of echoed what uh, Powell was saying, where they still see an issue with inflation and it's not coming down. And nobody kind of, I guess, listened to that for a while. I know we're down today, but I think, again, that's more of like an energy issue. Um, the U.S. Federal Reserve officials struck a hawkish tone in their first comments since the central bank held its policy interest rate steady at its meeting this week, but signaled that rate hikes will likely resume. And this is the quote, that core inflation is not coming down like I thought it would. And that's Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller. Uh, he said this at an economics conference in Norway. Th these videos are always so interesting to watch, right? These kind of big international discussions. And it seems like people talk a little bit more freely at them uh, than they do when they're speaking to, you know, not necessarily their constituents in this case of the Federal Reserve, but, um, you know, people in the, in the country uh, that they're overseeing, at least. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly Gold Report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. NN.com. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right. So look a little bit more into this. Um, you know, one of the things that Powell had said, uh, I think like maybe two meetings ago or maybe three. Uh, basically saying they're going to wait to see how credit tightening from the banks affected um, inflation, right? And would they need to take more action? Um, this Federal Reserve um, official here said, uh, it's still not clear that the recent strains in the banking sector materially intensified the tightening of lending conditions. Uh, the U.S. economy was still, quote, ripping along for the most part. 
um, with the underlying pace of price increases moving sideways. Of course, recent declines in headline inflation have been driven largely by food and energy prices. Volatile commodities whose price swing uh, can mask underlying inflation trends. Excluding those goods, the personal consumption expenditures price index of April was increasing at a 4.7% annual pace, more than twice the central bank's targets. Demand in the U.S. was weakening somewhat, he said, but, quote, I am still looking to be convinced of a plausible story that slowing demand returns inflation relatively quickly to the 2% target. That's a really interesting comment, right? Because their whole thing, essentially, that they're trying to do um, is, you know, decrease wages, and in some way that decreases demand uh, for certain things. And then there, that results in, you know, just through basic supply and demand um, would decrease the price, essentially. Um, and it's interesting to just hear him bring that up, right? Because is that really the way to do it? Is that really the best way to do it? Are the people who are getting wage cuts, and I bring this up all the time, but are the people who are having their wages cut, um, are they the ones really contributing uh, to inflation? The Fed this week ended its run of 10 consecutive rate hikes uh, when policymakers decided to keep the benchmark overnight interest rate, of course, uh, from a range of 5% to 5.25%. Fascinating anyway. I think, again, we are still in the woods. I'm going to be really curious to see, like, when the dust settles after this uh, kind of skip, you know, if there's any kind of better insight into really why they did it. Um, so, you know, the, the European Central Bank just decided to go ahead and, and deviate from what the Fed is doing and just raise rates even higher. Um, so, you know, we'll see kind of how that peels out and if there's any kind of real consequences for us not doing that uh, currently. And again, if we hit some situation where, um, you know, of course, there are droughts that are occurring and that's going to impact some of our, our foodstuffs. Um, but if energy, if something goes weird with OPEC or, you know, whatever, um, if an increase in that, you know, obviously will increase the general CPI. And then what is that going to do to the market, right? So, again, I think this is just more of like a see how it plays out over time. We stick kind of with this um, IT talk that we've been doing. I thought this was super interesting and, and quite a way to move forward. This is $930 million in grants announced in uh, President Biden's effort to expand Internet access to every home in the U.S., uh, the massive federal effort to expand Internet access to every home in the U.S. took a major step forward on Friday with the announcement of $930 million in grants to shore up connections in remote parts of Alaska, rural Texas, and dozens of other places where significant gaps in connectivity persist. And this is an interesting point where you're seeing government step in to do this. Um, I, I know that Starlink um, was essentially attempting uh, to fill these gaps as well, which was a pretty noble pursuit. And it's crazy seeing them in the sky as well. Um, very, uh, very sci-fi, I would say. Um, these networks are the workhorses carrying large amounts of data over very long distances, of course. White House's infrastructure coordinator said this. Um, they're the ones that are bridging the gap between larger networks and the last mile connections from tribal lands to underserved rural and remote areas to essential institutions like hospitals, schools, libraries, and major businesses. And, you know, unless you're living out there in order to get away from the Internet, uh, this is, you know, a positive. Having access to the internet does result in higher income. It results in, I guess this is arguable in some sense, but, but better education in a lot of ways. Um, the largest grant of nearly 89 million was awarded to an Alaska-based telecommunications company that hopes to build a fiber network through a remote section of the state where an estimated 55% of people lack basic internet. The expansion is one of several initiatives pushed through Congress uh, to expand high-speed internet connectivity uh, to the entire country. And as we go on, this will just become, this is just a game of getting the whole globe connected, right? And, uh, I mean, that's been the goal for quite a while. You know, we have the undersea cables, uh, which are very important uh, for, for connecting uh, the continents. What's interesting about that is there's some talk, and I, you know, like talking a little bit about some news that occurs uh, with the war that's going on. Um, but I guess, you know, the Russians had moved their uh, missiles to Belarus, and that um, caused an uproar and everything. Um, but they're now also talking about maybe sabotaging the undersea cables, which is just would be absolutely horrible.
but just to keep you in the loop of, you know, what they're talking about. Uh, very interesting stuff and, you know, maybe a little bit worrisome. All right. Obviously, we've had a lot of money flowing into these equities. We had so much sitting in, like, money market funds for a while. Uh, this is a report from Reuters. The U.S. equity funds registered the uh, biggest weekly inflow in 28 months. Uh, U.S. equity funds saw their most substantial weekly net purchases since early 2021 during the seven days leading up to June 14th. As concerns over a potential rate hike during the Federal Reserve's policy meeting this week were alleviated by cooling inflation readings. Again, I, I just think this isn't... 100% correct, and you just heard it from the Fed as well. The Fed left interest rates unchanged on Wednesday in line with investors' expectations and broke a streak of 10 consecutive rate hikes. According to Refinitiv Lipper data, U.S. equity funds drew a net of $18.85 billion worth of inflows in their biggest week, excuse me, weekly net buying since mid-February of 2021. You can see this here. U.S. large, small, and multi-cap equity funds attracted $7.76 billion, 3.33 billion and 1.93 billion worth of capital. And that flow, you know, will most likely continue to some extent, right? There's still a lot of money that's kind of sitting out currently. Uh, among sectors, obviously tech secured an immense amount at 1.73 billion, the biggest inflow since December of 2021. And investors also racked up financials, consumer discretionary, and industrial sectors, uh, fines of, uh, excuse me, 581 million, 517, and 460 million respectively. The money market funds witnessed net withdrawals of about $10 billion after observing net purchases for seven weeks in a row. And again, as those get drained out, uh, there's just a bunch of, of money that's uh, still waiting to get in to the market. Uh, data showed U.S. bonds received a net of $3.96 billion in inflows during the week after having a net of $577 million worth of outflows the previous week. People are trying to uh, restructure what's going on. Uh, Investors exited $374 million worth of inflation-protected bond funds in a ninth straight week of, of net selling. Yeah, the, like, I-bonds, obviously, you know, those can get sold out. But again, I'm, like, concerned reading these kind of things and reading, like, sentiment that people have. And, and it's always, like, it's the small voice that's saying, I don't know, guys, like, there is still inflation. What is essentially occurring right now uh, that is telling you that inflation is going down? And... Like, you, you heard it from, from the guy's mouth himself, that inflation is still persistent, and there's still a risk to the upside. So we might see a real pullback out of these um, if anything comes out that kind of dashes, you know, whatever mirage that a lot of people have currently. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. 
Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I was looking over the break a little bit at Kava, right? And that was the new IPO for the restaurant Kava. And uh, not much to say on it right now, uh, but it, it dropped 15% after its IPO. The IPO was hyped. Uh, unbelievably and it just still blows my mind one of the first things we like you know really talk about in any kind of investments class that we had like in college was uh, don't buy IPOs <laughs> like if, if, if it is a bloodbath in the beginning it shoots up every time and uh, you, you know if you're, you're buying at that top there you're, you're gonna get you're gonna get hurt pretty badly so West Pharmaceuticals gained 2.3 percent I only say that because my, uh, my granddad worked for them and so I thought that was uh, pretty neat that they're still in the game. Virgin Galactic, I think it was a few months ago that we were talking about how they were just closing doors entirely. Give me a second. What is their ticker? I thought it was space. Aha, uh -huh. obviously, only have four. So that just said, what's up? Give me 16% increase. Uh, so yeah, they're gonna put some Italian scientists on it. Uh, Virgin Galactic announced Thursday that monthly commercial flights to the edge of space will begin for ticket holders in August following a research flight planned for the end of June. Those will be Italian scientists up there. Uh, space tourism company will be taking a team of specialists with the Italian Air Force and the National Research Center of Italy to conduct, uh, excuse me, conduct microgravity research. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, that's kind of a neat little comeback story for them when they were definitely like, they released that really sad update a few months ago uh, saying they were done. So, and uh, it's kind of a novel way that they're doing it as well. How they have, you have like your aircraft and then your rockets on the side and it just essentially sends it off, which I think is, uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, we were talking about how uh, some of the dock workers in the West were striking and they reached a deal. Well, now uh, UPS workers are thinking of striking this summer and they're scrambling supply chains and home delivery. You know, these guys, like, just let's take a second to, like, <laughs> you know, really think about how integral they are uh, to our society. They don't have air conditioning in these vans. They work a lot. Um, so, you know, it might be worth giving a little bit to them. The unionized UPS workers voted overwhelmingly on Friday to authorize a strike setting the stage for a potential work stoppage if the package delivery company and Teamsters can't come to an agreement before their contract expires next month. Uh, the Teamsters said 97% oh, of unionized workers voted for the authorization, uh, which the union urged for in order to have more leverage during negotiations with the company. Um, if the multi-billion dollar corporation fails to deliver on the contract that our hardworking members deserve, the UPS will be striking itself. And it's just the supply chains, whatever energy is surrounding it, they're just, you know, we had a COVID plague them terribly. And then all these strikes that exist in uh, so many countries as well. You know, especially during a time where like the Federal Reserve is trying to lower uh, wages and a lot of these guys are arguing for better time off and, and better wages as well. If a strike occurs, it would be the first, in a f uh, first since a 15 day walk, excuse me, walkout by 185,000 workers that crippled the con uh, company a quarter century ago. So pretty impressive, and obviously they have a lot of um, bargaining power uh, with that, right? So Tommy was saying earlier today, you know, he was bringing it up, and we were speaking about it a little bit as well, uh, about the interest rate payments for loans that are about to flood back in, right? 
and it is yet to see what's going to happen and collection agencies are probably going to be booming around that time. This article came out, <laughs> it's just, you know, we got to, I think, probably look at this as like a society, people who live with each other, uh, to kind of figure out what's going on and is there a different method of, of doing things. You know, the interest rates on education is so expensive, excuse me, they're so high because you can't really like revoke it. You see what I'm saying? You can't take away that education. And so in order to kind of offset that risk, you know, with like a house or whatever, the bank can seize the house. Um, with a car, you can uh, repo the car, but it's kind of impossible to do with an education. So this headline is, uh, bankruptcy experts claim it may be your only option if the uh, 20K student loan forgiveness plan fails. Obviously, the president uh, was talking about forgiving up to 20,000. I think he said he was going to do all of it when he was getting elected, but now we're down to 20,000 here. Um, if the, so that would be in federal student loans debt per borrower, um, and this could soon reach endgame if the U.S. Supreme Court rules against the plan this month, as many predict that it will. Uh, if the plan is struck down, at least one legal expert says bankruptcy might be the only option for many borrowers. And let's be real, that's, that is absolutely going to occur, right? So many people have had to, like, you know, we've adapted to having this money, right? Um, after three years or whatever of not having to pay it. And so I don't know if people are going to be able to pivot that quickly and what they're going to lose. And things are so expensive now as well. Um, and some people are just going to outright not be able to afford this whatsoever. About 20% of student loan borrowers have already defaulted on a loan. Uh, according to Jonathan Pett, CEO of Upsolve, uh, the total amount already in default is more than $124 billion. That's just intense. Uh, this demonstrates a clear need for a plan to help borrowers facing challenges with paying off their debts. He said the Biden forgiveness plan is likely to be struck down by SCOTUS, uh, which means both loan payments and interest will resume not too long after. Relieving the debt through bankruptcy will be an option that many borrowers may be able to turn to instead. Uh, but before considering bankruptcy, obviously there's a lot of things that you as an individual can do. If you are an individual who's uh, worrying about this, definitely check out your options. Um, so bankruptcy is always the last resort for that kind of stuff and obviously has implications. We're talking to how Gen X isn't saving any money at all, and there just seems to be a lot of issues on the uh, individual level uh, within the American economy, right? Uh, the average balance in employer-sponsored savings plan last year was 112,000, and uh, that's a massive decrease, almost 30,000 from the 141,000, excuse me, 542 recorded in 2021, and this is for the uh, 401ks. Uh, from this latest report, um, from Vanguard, uh, combined have nearly 5 million participants with a median age of 43, and that's such plans as 401ks and 403bs, uh, as well as much smaller uh, universe plans. Vanguard participants' average account balances decreased by 20% since the year end of 2021, and that's driven primarily by the decrease in equity in bond markets over the year. The numbers look worse if you consider the median balances, which was just 27,376 last year. It's insane, down from 35,345 as well. Of course, you know, the market corrected quite a bit. And so there's something like with that that you kind of have to keep in mind when uh, uh, excuse me, reading some of these numbers. But not all is so bad. Uh, the factory boom is occurring, uh, this Yahoo Finance article is saying. Um, under President Biden, the manufacturing boom finally seems to be getting started, but we had lower output, or at least the output didn't, uh, according to like the, the last kind of like documentation on this, like American factories weren't putting out as much. Um, the manufacturing boom, of course, finally seems that it's getting started. Uh, since the beginning of 2022, construction spending on new factories has more than doubled from an annualized rate of 91 billion in January of 2022 to 189 billion in 2023. And that's the biggest jump by far in data going back to 2002. In April, a factory construction accounted for 9.9% of all construction, uh, which I thought was pretty impressive. And that's the highest portion in Census Bureau records going back to 1993. Private sector firms are building more US factories to cash in on unprecedented spate of legislation. Yeah, and that's the big thing, right? Like this kind of production is coming back to the US. Um, now it's for national security re uh, reasons, um, but the economy will adapt to that and uh, you know, hopefully we'll all be a little bit better 
uh, at the end. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back for a short segment. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFN Ed over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Um, you know, one of the big issues with pushing the solar panels and everything like that is going to be the waste. And this has been spoken about uh, since the kind of solar craze went up. And uh, it just makes me wonder sometimes if these large publications, you know, even listen, right, or, or think about these things, right? At least today, that is now being pushed, and this is uh, recycling, quote, end-of-life solar panels, wind turbines, is about to be climate tech's big waste business. A wind turbine is recyclable from the steel tower to the composite blades. Um, but that's a cumulative mass of 2.2 million metric tons of waste by 2050. 90% of end-life or defective solar panels also end up in landfills, largely because it costs far less to dump them uh, than to recycle them. Isn't that the, the story? And that waste is pretty nasty. I mean, you're talking like heavy metals, like cadmium and all that kind of nasty, nasty stuff for the environment. So any kind of solutions for that um, will be a positive and quite welcomed. For our little science thing of the day, it, it is about to be summer in Florida, and the uh, state bird becomes the mosquito during that time. Well, luckily, it seems like scientists might have figured out a new way uh, to repel them. We've been using DEET, you use a bunch of nasty chemicals that your skin absorbs, but apparently uh, you can use cellulose nanocrystals. And you put them in some kind of aqueous solution, 
it creates uh, actually a pretty significant barrier and that decreases, uh, decreases bites on humans from about 80%. The effect was further confirmed by artificial feeding on the Egypti species, wherein the uh, nanocrystals appears to act as a chemical camouflage to the many cues sought by insects. And you know, there's so many different alternatives. It turns out people just don't like spraying whatever the market currently has on themselves because you have the tiki torches that repel them, you know, you have um, the little lights, but all these things kind of affect the rest of the environment as well. And you kind of end up killing, um, you know, other species indirectly, which is bad for the environment. So this weekend, I'm going to bathe in that stuff and uh, hopefully can avoid the, the bites that I get consistently. Folks, thank you so much for joining me this week. It was so awesome to be with you guys. Um, we're out Monday. Tom will be back Tuesday. Uh, stay safe and happy Father's Day to all of you Tiger fathers out there. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great weekend.